All right, so, um, so questions. Yeah. I'm having a hard time understanding the difference between like the single um, implies thing and the double line. Ah, okay. That's yeah, that's, that's some kind of weird notation. Um, here, here's the whole deal. So we have this thing called direct reasoning which says that if we know P implies Q and if we know that P is true, we can conclude Q is true. Okay, mm -hmm. and we can write it like this where we have a horizontal line and things above here are things that we're told are true and then below the line we write something that we can conclude from that. One way to think of this is given this and this, we can infer that. Okay, okay? So and one way we can write that is like this. Given this and this, we can infer that. Uh, okay. So the double arrow really just means this is where we draw the horizontal line. Okay. It infers. Yeah. So do you want to go over anything with like direct indirect proofs or anything around that? Yes, sure. What what are you currently doing? Uh, 3.4 number two showed that the common fallacy is not a law of logic. Ah, um, so show that the common fallacy is not a law of logic. Um, so one way to do that might be with a truth table. Okay, you don't have to do it with proof. It's a little unclear how to do that with a proof. I mean, we can we can try and show that we're not ab able to conclude not Q, but that doesn't necessarily prove it. Okay, so I use conditional Right. And it doesn't necessarily prove Q, so we don't get a contradiction. But yeah, you could pick particular propositions P and Q and show that this fails to to be valid. Yeah. Disproving is usually easier because all you gotta do is find one bad example and you're done. Let's um let's try number five from the homework because I didn't assign that, but we can turn it into a question that looks like um, a question from part four. I'm not going to pass around an attendance sheet because I know if you're here today because I'll get your quiz. So um, so let's look at at five a. Um, which says if wages increase, there will be inflation. Uh, the cost of living will not increase if there is no inflation. Wages will increase, therefore the cost of living will increase. Um, and I don't know if this is true or not, but let's let's write it out and see if we can prove it. So let's make some propositions. So the first sentence is a compound statement. It's an if-then. What are smaller propositions we could write to build up that first if-then statement? Okay, let W be the proposition which says wages increase. All right, what's another proposition in there? Okay, should we call that I? Let I be the proposition. there will be inflation. All right, the cost of living will not increase if there is no inflation. So what are some propositions in there? The 
cost of living will not increase and there is no inflation, right? Um, now I'm going to suggest, and it doesn't matter, we get the same result in the end, but I'm going to suggest since we eventually have another phrase which says the cost of living will increase, let's make our proposition the affirmative. Cost of living will increase and then this first statement will be not that proposition. You can do it either way, um, but in the end, we're going to end up having to think about double negatives in our head, um, which for me is, is a little more confusing. So let L be the prop. Um, cost of living will increase. And then... Um, if there is no inflation, okay, we already have a proposition for there will be inflation. Uh, wages will increase, we got a proposition. Cost of living will increase, okay. Well, it's just one. I guess we could have used the negation. All right, so let's, let's write out in propositional calculus what these statements are. If wages increase, there will be inflation. So that's W implies I. Cost of living will not increase if there is no inflation. This is an if-then that's written backwards, right? This is saying if there is no inflation, the cost of living will not increase. So if there's no inflation, then there's no cost of living increase. And then it says wages will increase, so we're told W. And we're asked to conclude the cost of living will increase. So if you were playing along at home, there's the theorem and its supposed conclusion is L, and we're asked, is this valid or not? Um, so what do you think? What, what can we do with the three things we've been given? We could do De Morgan's. Um, De Morgan's. Contrapositive, okay. So let's call this one and two and three. And these are given. And let's go down to four. So we can do the contrapositive of two, which means L implies I. That's the contrapositive of two. What else can we do? Nothing that helps. Nothing that helps. Well, maybe something that helps. How about something that doesn't help? Let's do one and three together. We know that if W is true, then I is true. We know W is true. We can conclude I. That's direct reasoning. One and three. So we're told L implies I, and we're told I. Does that give us L? There's actually a name for that argument. Remember what this is called? Yeah, this is a good old fallacy. And what we're doing here is affirming the conclusion. So that suggests we could probably find values for these propositions where these first three statements are true, but L is not true. So this turns out to be not a valid argument. But I'm guessing the next one is, because it would just be so kind of unfortunate if both of these were invalid. So let's try this again with 5b. And then hopefully we get something we can actually prove. So if the races are fixed or the casinos are crooked, then the tourist trade will decline. Okay, 
So um, let R be the proposition. that the races are fixed. Uh, let's see be the proposition that casinos are crooked. Uh, let T be the proposition tourist trade will decline. trade declines and the police will be happy so let P be the proposition police are happy the police are never happy therefore the races are not fixed okay so I think we've got four propositions and I think those are sufficient to state all of these things so if the races are fixed which is R or casinos are crooked then the tourist trade will decline. So that's my first statement. If the races are fixed or casinos are crooked, then the tourist trade will decline. The second says if the tourist trade declines, then the police will be happy. So if T, then P. The police are never happy, so that's not P. And we're trying to conclude, therefore, the races are not fixed. So here's the theorem we're trying to prove. And we could also write it like this. So we could say prove that this is true or not true. So if, if we want to do this officially, right, this is what we're trying to show. We don't want to accidentally have not R as part of our proof because we don't know not R is true. So let me, let me do this like the full way. R or C implies T, that's a premise. Step two, T implies P, that's a premise. Step three, not P, that's a premise. And we're trying to get to not R. So what do you do? You go to your list of implications and you try to find ways to combine these things or change these things that will let you make new statements. And eventually we're hoping we can make the statement not R. Well, the only thing involving R is statement one, so we're going to have to do something here. C doesn't pop up anywhere. The casinos aren't mentioned in any other proposition. That's a red herring. It's just there to make the problem interesting or confusing. Well, we've probably got to do something with T, because that's in the only proposition that has an R. Can we do anything with T? Could do the chain rule on one and two. R or C implies P. That's the chain rule. One and two. Good. What else can we do? Contrapositive on four. Contrapositive on four. I like that. So contrapositive says not P implies not R or C. That's the contrapositive of four. Where do we go from here? We 
we can do De Morgan's on the right hand side, not R or C is not R and not C. Nice. 3 says not P and 6 says not P implies something. Let's use direct reasoning. Not P and not P implies that. We can conclude not R and not C. That's direct reasoning 3 and 6. And we're trying to get to not R. All right, conjunctive, conjunctive simplification. P and Q gives us P not R and not C gives us not R. And there we go. That's what we were asked to show. So yeah, that argument is logically sound and there's a proof that given these three things we can conclude not R. Mm-hmm. Um, so with the direct reasoning um, with number seven, it uses, since we know the police are never happy, um, we can uh, just assume it, we can pull it out of it? Yeah, so if the police are never happy, blah. Mm -hmm. The police are never happy, therefore, blah. So we can write down blah. Okay, and you can cut it out. Yeah. And that's, that's, it's also called detachment in here, right? If P, then Q, and if P is true, then Q is true. The simplification and the addition? Yeah. Oh, um, it's one of those things that's <coughs> almost too obvious. Um, <coughs> if P and Q is true, then we can conclude that P is true. That's all that conjunctive simplification says. If this is true and that is true, then P is true. Right, or equivalently, if P is true and Q is true, then we can say Q is true. Disjunctive addition says if P is true, then P or Q is also true. <coughs> because if P is true, well, that's true, so the or is true. So can you do that with, like, any element? Yeah, basically, I mean, Q could be anything. Could be complete <coughs> nonsense as long as it's a proposition. We can or it with P, and that's still going to be true, because P is true. So the simplification lets us throw away something if we're anding it. And the addition lets us add something by oring it. And it's, it's, you know, at this point, we know that both of these things are true. We'd be tempted to say, yeah, we're done, because we showed not R is true. But technically, in a proof, you need to have a line that actually says not R. And so the way we formally go from here to a line that says not R is conjunctive simplification in this case. So it's just kind of a formalizing step. Does that make sense? Could we show this with an indirect proof? Or a truth table. But usually when you're asked to show, we're not asking for a truth table proof. We're asking for using rules of logic. But yeah, technically, if we just wanted to prove it, we could use a truth table. Definitely. So indirect, what's the game plan for an indirect proof in general? Uh, negate the thing we're trying to show. Yeah. Right, so we're trying to show not R, so let's assume R. And if we assume R is true, what can we say without, for, forget about the formalities for a second, can you see a pretty quick path to a contradiction if we start off by saying R is true? Um, the police, the, from two and three, because if R is true, then 
we assume the trade will decline. If the trade will decline or the tourists will decline, then the police are happy. But police are not happy. Yeah. So, so if we start with R, if R is true, then we know R or C is true. And statement one says, therefore, T must be true. Statement two says, if T is true, then P has to be true. And statement three says, P is false. There's our contradiction right there. So this is a very, very short path for an indirect proof. All right, R, R or C gives you T. That's a premise. Um, and do we need some fancy name for this? Um, I mean, I, I would let you say at this point T is that, that R or C is true. But the way that's actually happening is since R is true, this is true or C um, implies T. I shouldn't have used T because let's say true or C implies T. And we have a property over here on page 58 that says true or, um, true or P is the same as true. That's a null law. So this says true implies t, and that tells us that t is true. And then you can put that together with t implies p, and get p, and then we have not p, and there's your contradiction. So if you throw in all the formalism, it takes a few more steps, but that's exactly the logic of it, right? If r is true, this is true, t is true, p is true, p is false, contradiction. All right, any other questions? What are all the answers? <laughs> I'll tell them to you in a little bit. All right. Um, I wrote this up and I said 30 minutes, but I don't want you to freak out, so I changed it to 45 minutes, but you might finish it in 30 minutes. Um, I don't want time to be a constraint on here, basically. So, um, forty-five minutes. And if you have questions, if it's not clear what I'm asking for, please ask for clarification. Will there still be pressure? Um, if it's a thirty-minute exam, yeah, I'll lecture afterwards. If it's forty-five, we'll probably just call it quits after that. So.